Hello and welcome to the In the Tank podcast, episode 225, the podcast that explores work of think tanks across the country. As always, I'm your host, Donald Kendall, and we've got a full crew today joining us. We have Justin Haskins, editorial director here at the Heartland Institute. How are you? Good, sir. I'm doing great. I love it when you go to me first. That's you right. should always go to me first, I think. Yes. I think I'm the right guy to be the number one. <laughs> Right. And uh, number two, uh, Isaac Orr. <laughs> number two is right. <laughs> Research Who fellow. Who does number two work for? At the center of the American experiment. How are you good, sir? I'm good. Yeah, very timely with your Austin Powers reference. That's great. That plays really well in 2020. And then also joining well, they're, us. They're coming out with a fourth one finally. Yeah, right. I've heard that for a decade now. <laughs> Uh, also joining us, we have Jim Lakely, Director of Communications here at the Heartland Institute. Jim, how are you? I'm doing great. Glad to be on the podcast. Absolutely. So we have a uh, a pretty interesting show here for you. Uh, we'll get into it in a little bit. We're going to be talking about some uh, China one-child policy type stuff, uh, some world population control, and uh, how that kind of relates into climate change alarmism. Yeah. Uh, I do have a proposed bill of the week. But you know how this podcast goes. Sometimes we might cut that out because <laughs> if our discussions goes long. Um, so maybe we'll have that at the end. I don't know. But I want to start off with an update to our Democratic candidate survivor pool. No, we, we, need, we need a breaking news audio drop or something for this segment, by the yes, way. Yes, we do. Isaac actually told me uh, as we came on live before Justin oh. came on. So you're going to hear Justin's uh, actual response here live. Isaac, what happened? Justin's going down. Marianne Williamson calls it a day. She officially she officially quit, huh? Yeah, she did. She said, you know what? Living in a world where Justin might win this survivor <laughs> pool isn't worth living in. So I'm just going to I'm going to off my presidential campaign. OK, technically, though. Uh -oh. Yeah. OK, yeah, yeah. She 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 did sort of quit. She technically only is suspending the campaign. No, no, no. And I know that normally that means quitting. That's but over. But in the case of Marianne Williamson, she could unsuspend this campaign at any minute. Oh wait, hang on, hang on. This might this might uh, upend this uh, this breaking news. Marianne Williamson ends 2020 presidential campaign headline, but it's from CNN. Ooh, so it could be the exact opposite. Yeah, this yes. is why are we even talking <laughs> about Wapo, Wapo says she's out. And oh, great. It, it, More fake news. <laughs> why, why, should, why should I listen to any of these fake the news? The Hill, or? USA Today, ABC, fake news, fake NBC, news, fake New York news. Times, LA Times. More fake news. Can you give me one real news <laughs> site, please? You, you don't need news. news. Who? Yeah, look up Fox, Fox News. News. Oh, well, Fox if, News. If Justin <laughs> hasn't written a column about it, it didn't happen. Right. <laughs> look, look the, I, I started this pool, and the rules were, you know, if, if the if the terminology suspended the campaign, that's done. You're yeah. done, so it, it, there's no Only, coming back. Well, hold on. Wait so a second. it's out. You get you get 12 well, points for wait that. A, you are now in second. third place. Loser, loser, <laughs> loser. Wait a second. What if she unsuspends the campaign? If she, I, we, I can do math. I can reinstate it if she unsuspends exactly the campaign. Right. Right. And so all I'm saying is I understand she suspended the campaign. All I'm saying that is happen. that if anyone in the world were to unsuspend a campaign. <laughs> no. <it would> be, <laughs> well, that's actually a good point. But, that. I think it'd be Wayne Messam. So, so yeah, that's, <laughs> no way. Mess him up. All, Hashtag all mess him up. All he needed was five dollars. The man got more press from raising five dollars for his campaign yeah, than if, his entire campaign. If I don't, the only press bucks. that man got was from this podcast, which is probably about <laughs> worth five dollars. So, all right. Uh, so, who's in first place? So, so, in first place, Isaac Orr is in first place with forty points. And how many candidates he have left? He's he, got two. He has uh, Isaac has Klobuchar. Isaac has uh, Pete Buttigieg, uh, Cory Booker, and Klobuchar. So okay. he's got three. How is left. Cory? Okay. If, are you telling Cory Booker is still in this? Yes, That's he, not is. Right, he is. is it? Google it. Google it while he's he continues still in the updates. Jim, who's in second place? Uh, second place is me. I still have three candidates left. I got my first round pick, Elizabeth Warren. Uh huh. I have uh, John Delaney. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I have uh, is that Michael Bennett? Yeah, that's Michael Bennett. <laughs> He's I, I all... hardly recognize these guys. So done, 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 all done. But yeah, no but chance I, they survive. They're still in. Though. Well, they're still in. I'm I'm in second place. That's with crap. Four... That is such crap, dude. <laughs> Where? I didn't draft your team. It's lost to the Titans. <laughs> now I'm gonna whine about everything. Yeah. And then who's in third? Who's in third? So, so I'm in second place with 41 points, just one point behind <laughs> Isaac. In third place is Justin now with 52, and he's got Weld. He has uh, who we put in there just to round out the twenty five. Yes, Justin has Bernie and and Bill Weld. That's it. That's, That's it. Got okay. left. Yeah. All right. And then uh, Andy's in. Uh, uh, well, don't talk about fourth Andy place, and I. you're in fifth place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys Whatever. Are way we can out of skip it. those. Can we put an asterisk next to Marianne Williamson's name? No, Char. Like, sure, I think we should have an asterisk no. because, come on, we all know she's going to get back into it. No, eventually. she's not. No, she's not. If you would like to no, do your own not, Google Justin. chart with an asterisk on it to make yourself feel better, so you sleep nice at night, go ahead and do it. But I'm not doing it in the official. Google. Okay, so this this ties in to my kind of opening chit chat type of thing that I had planned uh, as of last night. But I was thinking in this day and age where you have like movies where, you know, like these uh, these uh, Iron Man and Thor team up and they have the Avengers come out. Is it possible uh, that like we could see like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders just like right now join campaigns and just like run as a as a two, you know, ticket party right now? Well, well which one would have to drop out, though? No, well, like obviously, Bernie would have to take a back seat to her because she's a woman, right? It would be it, yeah. it would, optically he would have to do that, and he would be the VP. And then I've already thought about this: she would put him in charge of overhauling like the healthcare system or something. <laughs> That'd be great, right? I mean, so, what? Yeah, yeah I, I so I I have for a very long time thought that that's where we were headed. Uh, that we were going to have a merged campaign because I figured at some point they would know one of them can't win while the other one is still in the race. Uh But now I am convinced that's not going to happen. And the reason for that is very recently I saw that Elizabeth Warren was at campaigning in New York City and her big, uh, you know, special guest or whatever for the event was Julian Castro. Sure. And he came out and endorsed her and they yeah. were up there holding hands together and singing and whatever. I don't know. Whatever they do, whatever those communists do. <laughs> and um, I think without question, that's going to be her vice president. It's vice possible. But like I'm, I'm looking and at you it. Have a Hispanic on the ticket. And you have a woman on the ticket. But it's like the people that, you know, they, they think that the old guard, you know, like the, the Hillary Clinton snaking the election out from underneath Bernie Sanders is going to happen again. Except for this time, it's going to be uh, Joe Biden taking it out from under like a real progressive, you know, uh, candidate. So I thought, wouldn't it be like possible? And it would make tons of headlines. You got like two candidates who are in the upper echelon of this race. Julian Castro's you know what he like averaged one percent he's nothing so bernie sanders and elizabeth warren joining forces power couple taking out the old guard which is joe it's, biden it, it so i going back to what i was saying before i i think that that made sense except now what i, well, what I was going to say is that Bi- S- sanders would only have to do that if he believes that warren is essential and that she or or vice versa right that one of them won't lose or, or won't uh, be able to stand on their own, um, that neither of them are going to be able to just run and win without the other support. But uh, Warren has collapsed in many but, of these polls. And sure. I think now what the Sanders people are thinking is she's just going to lose yeah, on but, her own. But it's like if and I, then it, she'll have no choice but to come crawling to us. And and so it's not going to be this sort of merged campaign. I mean, Elizabeth Warren, who's a senator from Massachusetts, which borders the state of New Hampshire, is losing in New in the most recent poll that I see here. She's fourth in New Hampshire. Sure. So if she actually finishes fourth in New Hampshire or something like that, then everyone's just going to say her campaign's done because if you can't, as a Massachusetts senator win in new hampshire or at least come close to winning in new hampshire then your your campaign is over and she'll have no choice right. but to endorse sanders but, and then but, it won't really be a merged ticket per se it'll just be warren that's the only job she can find kind of thing. but she's still polling at like you know pretty good numbers he's pulling at really good numbers you add those two together and it destroys biden I mean, I would think that it would come off like uh, in like uh, we're rising above the idea of petty politics because these greater issues need to be addressed. So we're joining campaigns. Jim, 
Is this completely outside the bounds of reality? It's completely outside the bounds of reality. Okay. That's not going to happen. Because you have to have one of these candidates uh, decide, you know, after all this time, before we even get to Iowa, I just really wanted to be vice president. I mean, even the lowest people in these polls, you know, it's an ego trip. It's a it's a it's a well, doesn't doesn't the fact that they're not joining like campaign reveal that that it's an ego trip and well, that this is all not about the greater the greater thing that's going on out there, the things that need to be addressed. It's about, uh, you know, I get to be president for four years. It well, just seems like a joke. Well, there's but the, the idea that Bernie and and Warren would join forces. I mean, neither of them, neither of them would say, you know, be, well, you'd be vice president. No, you'd be vice president. I mean, come on. The idea that those you could get those two in a room and they would agree that one of us is going to be like a second said. banana with no job. I mean, come on. After all this time, no way was Bernie ever going to be vice president. That he, idea he is would absurd. Have to. He would have to. He would have to in this scenario, which is why it was ridiculous from the in the first place. Okay. Bernie Sanders would no, never I, agree to be vice president. Are you crap? But, it, you, but no if he way. was in complete control, like, OK, your one job, Bernie, is to do with health care. Like, we pretty much agree on, on health care when it comes to whatever. So I'm going to put you in charge of that. Like, you know, the, the, like the petty squabble, like if you look at it, they agree on like 95 percent of stuff. So this idea that because we disagree on 5 percent of stuff that we're going to like bludgeon each other and then, you know, Biden's going to take the victory. I don't know. It just seems kind of revealing that this is all just like a game, you know, for them. And it's a an ego trip, like you kind of said. Um I don't know. I thought that it was like a, a not a revolutionary idea, but like a more palatable in this day and age. I just don't I, see I, it. I, I agree. I just think that what Jim has said is Jim. I, th I think what Jim said is accurate, except I think that Warren is just going to lose at yes. this point. And I thought she was going to win. I thought she had a great chance of actually winning. Uh, in part because I thought Sanders at some point when he had the health issue would have no choice but to get out. And then maybe the best he could do because of the health issue would be the vice president. But now at this point, she just is so unlikable. And people are realizing that now, even among Democrats, hardcore Democrats, she's just not palatable at all. Uh, that if she's finishing third, fourth, fifth, something like that. Uh, she's not going in the first few primaries. She's going to be forced out of the race. She's got no choice but to crawl back to Bernie Sanders and beg for a, 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 some kind of cabinet position, maybe yeah. VP, and mm. that'll be where she ends up. Isaac, any input onto this conversation? Do you think that it's just like a total fantasy that this something like this would ever happen, or? I just think this is such a boring topic. Like, right. who cares? All like, right. they're going to figure it out. The caucuses are coming up. Like. Okay. Let's just move on. Let's move on. Move on. I don't really <laughs> like politics anyways, but I just thought this idea would be uh, would be interesting, especially whatever. Let's move on. Um, so we decided on the main topic of discussion this uh, this early this week because over the weekend I watched a documentary that's on Amazon titled One Child Nation. And I was absolutely blown away by this. So I forced uh, people on this call to watch it. <laughs> uh, I think I think Justin, you watched the entire thing. Jim, I think yes, you watched the entire thing. Isaac, you watched some clips, I believe you said. Um, yeah, if, if you count the preview. Well, that's a clip. Clip. <laughs> sure. So uh, I was I was absolutely blown away by this. And I know from talking to Justin prior to recording that he believes that this is totally worthy of a major discussion. Uh, Jim, I don't know if you feel the same way. I do. Okay, great. So we're all on the same page here. Uh, yeah, so no one cares what Isaac thinks. Yeah, so no, no kidding. Well, he watched a clip. A, Nobody cares. I'm a swore. <laughs> so, uh, so One Child Nation, this is about the one child policy that was in place in China starting in 1979, and it carried on through... Uh, 2015, and where they um, relaxed it to a two-child policy. So, you know, a little bit of momentum there. But this is a concept that I had learned about in school. And when I say learned about, they briefly mentioned it in passing. And uh, that's about it. So I was aware of this concept. Uh, I was told by others to check out this documentary, and I was floored by it. This thing was insane. It's about an hour and a half long. Highly recommend it. Um, so I, I don't know. Let's, I guess, start with Justin. What are your initial thoughts when you watch this? 
So I think that the biggest takeaway, and, and I think anyone who's listening to this now who thinks to themselves, eh, yeah, I don't know if I want to watch a, a documentary, a whole documentary about this topic. At the very least, watch the propaganda films that they show mm-hmm. in this documentary. They show lots of Chinese propaganda films uh, that talk about the importance of, of having one child. Uh, it involves lots of women dancing, uh, singing about how great this is, talking about how wonderful the Chinese Communist Party is, how they have incredible foresight and how great their national policies are and on and on and on. Um, that alone is just is so interesting because this is not something that happened in the 1940s or 30s. I mean, these are videos from the 1990s, mm-hmm. you know, and for the early 2000s where these people are chanting and singing about how wonderful population control is. Right. It's really, really interesting. And that coupled with uh, the, 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 the most powerful part of the documentary, which talks about all of the forced abortions and forced um, contraception and different things. That, yeah, the, all that the Chinese government was imposing on people to varying degrees, often at the local level that involved, you know, village elders basically grabbing women in the middle of the night and doing horrible, horrible things to them uh, because they wouldn't voluntarily sterilize themselves in order to help achieve this goal of having uh, only one child, mm-hmm. um, agreeing to only have one child. I think those things are the most interesting parts of the documentary and the things that are that are most worth uh, people seeing. Yeah. From our perspective here at Heartland, I think that the really core essential part of this whole concept of population control in general, but one child policy is, is the perfect example of it, is that this is the logical end game of many of the policies that we're talking about. And it's and it's a result of, especially on the environment and climate issue. Yeah. I know we're going to get into that. Yes. But um, it, it's the logical end of a society that says, we are not going to put the rights of the individual before the good of the collective. Yes. We're going to put whatever's good for the collective, which, by the way, the Chinese use throughout their propaganda for one-child policy, that actual term, the collective, yeah. and putting that first – That concept permeates throughout everything that the left does to one degree or another. So the only difference really between radical leftism in China and radical leftism anywhere else in the world, including here in the United States, is the extent to which they're willing to take that basic principle and expand it out. That that is a fantastic tease for the conversation that I want this to kind of morph into, uh, because the people that have seen this documentary and and Jim, I want to get to your kind of uh, uh, initial reactions as well. But people that have seen this, I I could see a criticism being that this is kind of like a really honed in look at some of the victims of this policy. And so what I have done over the past couple of days is really do research into the policy kind of context uh, uh, that surrounds this whole thing. So I I want this kind of conversation to kind of add to the documentary and not just be about it. Uh, But before we get into some of those things, Jim, initial reactions. Well, I agree with Justin that the the propaganda films... uh, you know, I was, I was a kid of the Cold War, so, uh, you know, I'm familiar with these materials, not not from China, actually, the first time I've seen them from China, but from the Soviet Union. And I studied um, uh, the Soviet Union when I was in college, so it was very interesting seeing the propaganda films um, back then. But, uh, Justin, it wasn't just the, uh, one, one of the things that really struck me about one of the propaganda films was that they had children, yeah. children yes. singing children's yes. songs. Right. I mean, the irony of that. And, of course, it, it was, was a so boy. Creepy. So Very creepy, Very creepy. Singing that this, you know, the um, our, our leaders are the creators of family bliss. Uh-huh. You know, they, they, you know, we're talking yeah. hundreds of millions of births and hundreds of, you know, prevented, they said. You know, of course, most of those by abortion and, and sterilization. And... Again, Justin, it's not just about, you know, as you said, it's 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 not actually for the good of the collective. It's it's what the people in power with guns say is the collective good. Yes. And we can get to that, too. Uh, but, yeah, just sticking with the propaganda, like one of the most kind of like a crazy thing to me is just how blunt it was. You know, this wasn't just like, you know, having a picture on the wall that showed like parents with their one kid. There was some of that. But like these songs 
that they're singing are just talking about like how like you're gonna starve if we have too many kids right. like that like why don't you hum a few bars for us donald <laughs> yeah, that was my that was the closest i can do of it but, yeah but yeah like just the blunt nature of the propaganda yeah. and it was just spray painted onto the walls yeah. i wrote one i literally stopped the video and wrote one of the lines down these are there's women dancing in these like uniform dresses it's like 1990s and the lines that they were singing were literally, we have taken the one child policy to heart. Our lives are so great now, thanks to the party's foresight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I yeah. mean, that is so weird. That is such a weird thing to sing. It was so blunt as Don. Yeah, said. but maybe so it blunt. rhymes in, in Chinese. <laughs> That's you're probably right. true. Like, you're so, weird because right. it doesn't rhyme. <laughs> so <laughs> no, it's weird because of what it says. You're taking but it, it also totally out of context. So oh. then the 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 movie. Just go imagine a stairway to heaven didn't rhyme. <laughs> You'd be like, what the heck is this stupid crap? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Um, so then it kind of goes into just like the way that this policy is carried out and the the level of of uh, and, and Justin already kind of referenced it of forced sterilization of people, uh, forced abortion of of hundreds of millions, potentially uh, kids. It, it was I had to watch it in half hour chunks like I couldn't sit there and watch an entire hour and a half in, in a row. I seriously did it over the span of three days. But to kind of back up a step, I want to talk about like the context that actually initiated some type of this policy to take effect. So it was the the 60s and the 70s and probably earlier than that. It was this idea, this kind of this alarmism that overpopulation was going to lead to mass famine and starvation and poverty across the globe. And that basically if we didn't get out ahead of this. That, uh, you know, that that was the future that we were going to be, you know, uh, that's going to be forced upon us, basically. Um, so China was the first first. Well, they weren't the first. They were just the ones that did it to the biggest degree to initiate some type of massive population control effort. And that is kind of the stuff that that they reference it in the in the documentary, but they really don't go into depth on it. And that was the stuff that kind of interested me the most. Yeah. And it and like the first reaction, I was just like. This is the climate alarmism of like the 60s and 70s. Right. Well, I mean, the, we've, we've talked about Paul Ehrlich and the, and the population bomb a lot yeah. on this podcast. Yeah. I, I seem to bring him up every other podcast. But what's interesting <laughs> was interesting. Full stop. Yeah. Paul was, Ehrlich was wrong. Full stop. Well, he was. Uh, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, there was there were a billion Chinese uh, when this program started. And there's 1.4 billion Chinese today. Mm. Um, and so what I actually looked up some st statistics uh, the median age back when this began, the median age in China was 22. Yeah. That is the age of a very vibrant society with a very bright future. Today, the median age in China is 38. Wow. They, they are, they've literally committed demographic suicide. Um, and in fact, because of culturally, the Chinese much more greatly value boys over girls. Yes. Um, to the fact of talk about propaganda and indoctrination and cultural um, you know, norms, even, even the adult women um, tend to favor their boys and discount their girls. It's really, it's really amazing to see this in this film. How much the indoctrination of that of that mindset um, permeates the Chinese society. But there are today seventy million more men than women right. in China. So this is seventy million men who will not get married because there isn't enough for everybody. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I saw I saw another study that shows that um, that skewed sex or, or gender ratio is um, chiefly responsible for a 34% rise in crime in China because mm -hmm. these are idle young men with no future prospects of marriage. Or if they want to get married, maybe they'll, they'll go into a life of crime to have enough money to get the very few women that, that they have a chance for. So this, this, this policy is so disastrous. It's, it was, econo it was um, an economic kind of uh, bad idea um, because now they have fewer young workers to, to, you know, the median age has gone up so high. Yeah. Uh, but, but also it wasn't necessary because they weren't going to starve. One of the, the mother of the filmmaker had said that, um, you know, she was glad she was very happy for this policy. She's excited about it right. because it, Elsewise, you know, we we would have had to resort to cannibalism. Mm -hmm. This is the same garbage that Paul Ehrlich wrote in his Population Bomb book, yeah, yeah. and you know, it's not true. If if China had just continued the way it was, way it went, uh, the world would have fed them all because of technology advances. So so you know, this is what happens in a totalitarian society. They, you can have some crazy nut people, <laughs> nut jobs who run the country, implement such a such a brutal anti-human oh, policy yeah. and carried out to such a large scale it's, it's a it's a global 
um, historic tragedy, this policy. Yeah. And another thing that the, you know, cause that's the, that's the type of stuff that I, I remember learning about in school, the idea of the discrepancy in, in men versus women, because men wanted the, uh, progenerate their, their lineage, you know? So the only way to do that would be to have a male, right? Cause women marry into a different family. Right. Uh, additionally, there's like the four two one problem, which is the idea that like any one child now has two parents that they theoretically will have to take care of uh, as they age, as well as the uh, four grandparents that they will have to uh, take care of as well. So it's just kind of this like unsustainable um, way of going. But but I want to kind of want to get back to that kind of context of the the way that the planet would be if uh, or the planet was. Isaac is distracting me, sorry, uh, to actually get some of the policy like this enacted in a mass scale. And it's very similar to like the climate change stuff that's going on today. So the, there was um, there was a U.N. Uh, what is the actual name of the organization? The U.N. Fund for Population Activities, which I did not know existed. And they were the ones that were really trying to get countries to agree to this idea of population control. And throughout the 70s and the 80s, they have these uh, UN world population conferences that would be held in different uh, country, uh, different cities across the world. Um, the International Parliamentary Assembly on Population and Development, which happened in Mexico City in like the 80s. So it sounds very familiar to like whatever COP25 stands for, you know, today. Um, and then and then they would pass things um, called like the World Population Plan of Action, which was a doctrine that was uh, put together in the 70s that was passed at one of these world population conferences. And that just made me think of the Climate Treaty of Paris, you know, the Paris Climate Treaty. So it's like this type of rhetoric that was really just like going around that we're all going to starve to death. We have to do something before it gets out of control. I, I couldn't help but have that same climate change you know, uh, uh, thoughts. Right. And people today believe that propaganda, just like uh, this filmmaker's um, a female Chinese woman's mother believed the propaganda. She says we'd all we'd have been cannibals. Mm -hmm. And she actually went back to, um, you know, she thought about well, my generation had it worse. And so and then of course, your grandfather's generation had it even worse than that. Of course, she's talking about the Great Leap Forward and other, you know, totalitarian disasters, which resulted in the deaths of hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. Um, a, a, tens of millions. Tens of millions. Well, I mean, communism in general though, sure, is, is sure. more than 100 million. And so, you know, to carry out these kind of proposals uh, or these plans, um, you know, th th I don't think there's any doubt that that the, the, the nuttiest of the climate nuts at the UN and other places look to China with jealousy because well, they would be able to carry this out. But how do you carry it out? Well, uh, one of the people that uh, one of the doctors, she, she said she'd kill probably 60,000 babies. Yeah. And now she is actually doing treating infertility to atone for her sins, which was the most beautiful part of it, this whole thing. It was I, beautiful. I it thought was that beautiful. was great. But she described that, um, you know, they had to kidnap women and tie them up and bring them to us like pigs yeah. for us to, to carry out the forced sterilization and abortions. I mean, this is what. This is the that is actually the end result of what happens. If you want to impose these kind of policies that are anti-human, that any human being with any agency whatsoever will resist to the death, this is what it comes to. And um, you know, <laughs> then you know the United Nations. I'm not saying the United Nations is a totalitarian, and this is where where it's going. But if they are serious about this, if they actually believe this propaganda about human activity is going to make this planet uninhabitable and it's going to result in, in billions of deaths across the country, why wouldn't you do this? This mm -hmm. is justified by that. Now, you can say you can you can debate whether or not the, the leaders of China actually believed this stuff or whether they were just exercising um, their will for the sake of it. But this is the end result of that, because if you're serious about this, what happened in China from 1979 to about 2015 is what is required. Right. And and to kind of go back to that um, that thing that's the equivalent of the Climate Paris Treaty, the World Population Plan of Action, like they encourage nations to develop population policies and they recognize the right of individual governments to determine their own population policies. Also in there, they have language talking about how, you know, like never should uh, be infringed is the individual's right to procreate, basically. Right. And they so they have like this kind of these safeguard verbiage in there to, to make it seem like we'll never go as far as initiating a one child policy like in China. Uh, this is predates that. Um, and, you know, forced sterilization, all that type of stuff. No, 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 we're not, we're not talking about that. But then we fast forward to when China is actually doing that. 
And then even during that, the the UN uh, Fund for Population Activities or whatever it's called, they awarded, they granted an award to the official that was in charge of China's one child policy. So they were rewarding these people even after this was starting to be carried out. You ended. Yes. So the idea that they're on one hand, they're going to say, no, we're not going to go that far. But then once it is going that far and they're okay with it, that should send a shiver up your spine. But uh, Justin, I don't know. You want to jump in? Yeah, but I, I think that, that that that's probably the most important part of this whole conversation is that ultimately everybody is saying, whether it's about, you know, man caused climate change or population crisis or mass starvation or whatever the sort of crisis is that's facing humanity that needs to be solved by some powerful centralized government, whether it's in one country or at the United Nations or wherever, they always make that promise. Don't worry, we're not going to actually take away your your freedom of religion or your freedom to associate or your freedom to of speech or we're not going to ever take away your personal freedoms. We're just saying we need to provide all these programs that are going to solve all of your problems. We just want to help you. That's it. That's all we want to do. We want to help you. But then what inevitably happens in all of these programs around the world is you have these programs, they fail. And then what do you do? If they failed, when people freely chose not to follow through the program that you created, well, then what do you do? And the answer is always in all of these countries, whether it's in the Soviet Union or it's in China or it's in Venezuela or wherever it is, the answer is, well, we're going to force you to do it then. You're not do, you're not choosing to do the right thing, so we're going to force you to do the right thing. Now, in America, we've had instances where we've done this. It's not like Americans have a tendency to think of, of, of their own country and think, well, yeah, we've done bad things to certain minority groups or, you know, to, uh, you know, for African-Americans, for instance, or to Native Americans or whatever. But generally speaking, these kinds of things could never happen here, except these kinds of things have happened here in variety in a variety of different ways. Um, there was this thing called prohibition. Remember that where the government said uh, we think it's wrong for people to drink alcohol, so we're just going to ban alcohol. We're not going to allow anyone to drink it. And 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 then when all of these gangs and organized crime started and all of that, well, we're going to crack down on all of these different things. We're going to stop this from happening. And, and at one point, the government – this is a true story. The government actually poisoned alcohol. They knew the alcohol was going to be consumed. They poisoned it on purpose – so that people would drink it and be per dissuaded from drinking alcohol anymore. Hmm. So, I mean, these kinds of things have existed throughout the course of American history, even as recently as Obamacare. Really, when you think about what Obamacare, one of the core provisions of Obamacare was, we're going to force people to buy health insurance and be because we think you should have health insurance. And if you don't buy health insurance, we're going to make you buy it. You had your chance to choose to buy it. If you're going to choose not to do the right thing, then we're going to force you. And if you don't buy it, then we're going to penalize you. Mm -hmm. And if you're an employer and you can afford to buy it for your employees, then you're going to buy it. And, and then when you had employers saying, well, we can't buy, say, uh, contraceptives or a, we're not going to pay for abortion or things like that because we think that's wrong, um, what, which has happened for many different employers, Hobby Lobby and, and others – what the Obama administration said is too bad. We mm -hmm. think it's for the collective good for you to provide this service to people. And so we're going to make you do it, even though it violates your rights. We don't care if you're a nun, if you're, you, you know, the little sisters of the poor and uh, you don't want to buy contraceptive services for your employees because it's against your religious beliefs. We don't care. We're going to make you do it anyway. Yeah. So this concept exists in all liberal policies uh, and and it's and it's been throughout American history. It's why we had concentration camps in World War II. It's why we have uh, all these different policies with Obamacare. It's why they're calling for single payer health care right now. It's why they're trying to control the the products that you buy under the Green New Deal and the different things that you can do. It, it, I mean, it's throughout uh, American history this has existed, not yeah. to the extent that you see in China, but it's the logical end result of right. it. Yeah, I've got a I've got a couple of articles uh, that I link in the show notes. Uh, one of them is from the Cato Institute, and this is an article uh, titled "Politicians' Support for Population Control is Dangerous." 
So this was written after that uh, town hall, that disastrous climate change down town hall where it was like seven hours long, where Bernie Sanders basically said that he would be open to uh, uh, basically starting up policies that would help population control. Um, and it goes through a couple of interesting dates, things that I was not aware of uh, in 1966. So this was kind of height of that alarmism when it came to population control. And I think the population bomb came out like a year afterwards. U.S. President Lyndon Johnson made foreign aid dependent on countries adopting population control. In 1969, President Richard Nixon established a separate office of population within the USAID and gave the, the department a $50 million annual budget. In uh, 1977, the head of that department, who his name is Dr. Ravenholt, which just like, think about that for a second. Like That's, that's the name of a Bond villain. Right. <laughs> like, Dr. Ravenholt, he says that he hoped to sterilize a quarter of the world's women. And so this happened in 1977. He made that statement. So where the population of the world was roughly 4 billion, the, the population of China around then was roughly 1 billion. So that's a quarter of the population right there. So logical starting point for that type of thing. Uh, by the 1980s, the background document to the International Conference on Family Planning, co-written by the UN Population Fund, the International Planned Parenthood F uh, Federation, the Population Council decreed, when provision of contraceptive information and services does not bring down fertility levels quickly enough to help speed up development, governments may decide to limit to the freedom of choice of the present generation. So while it starts off with just like, OK, we're just going to try to, you know, help you or whatever, come, uh, you know, just family planning type of language, then it gets into the straight up coercion. That's just the, the slight slippery slope of this whole thing. And it's uh, it's pretty disturbing when you see how it's played in American politics, even up to the 80s. It's uh, a little scary there. I think I think before we move on, we should reiterate the point that all of this ties in perfectly with what's happening with climate change. Mm -hmm. Because as Jim mentioned earlier, what the left is essentially doing with climate change is saying climate change is an existential crisis. We're all going to die mm -hmm. as a result of this. The world is in peril and human life is is on the verge of of disappearing. These are the kinds of things that they're saying. Mm -hmm. It's the same sort of thing that they were saying in China in in the 1970s, okay? The same things they were saying in the United States in the 1970s over population control. They they're, they're making these same kinds of arguments and they're saying if we don't do something right now, if we don't change something right now, then we're all going to die. Well, you might be thinking, well, okay, but that's just, you know, they want renewable energy or whatever. But it's not that hard to imagine a scenario where maybe they enact the Green New Deal or something like that, and we have all renewables. And guess what's going to happen? Global CO2 emissions is going to continue to go up. So what are they going to do? They're going to have to do something else because the existential crisis is still there. We have to stop it. We have to go to the next measure. Well, what's the next measure once you've gotten rid of all of the oil and natural gas and all of this stuff that's growing the economy right now. What, what do you do when you get rid of all of that? Well, you're going to have to do something else. And maybe that something else is, well, maybe people, we should just be having fewer children. Maybe if there were less people in China, for instance, or, or less people around the world in these growing countries that are using all these fossil fuels that are burning CO, you know, creating CO2 emissions that are destroying the world. Maybe if there were fewer people in these countries, maybe we would all be better off. And in fact, China in, in uh, 2007, China actually, when, when people were criticizing China for not doing enough about global warming, not reducing their CO2 emissions enough, China's one of their primary defenses was they came out and said, look, we've done more to fight against global warming than anyone because we had this one child policy. Hmm. We have this one child policy that's <laughs> wow. eliminated 300 million births. And in fact, this came from a this came from a, a Reuters story from 2007. This is incredible. This is from the report. It says China, which rejects criticism that it is doing too little to confront climate change. That criticism is still exists, by the way, says that its population is now 1.3 billion against 1.6 billion if it had not imposed tough birth control measures in the late 1970s. 
The number of births avoided equals the entire population of the United States. Beijing says that fewer people means less demand for energy and lower emissions for heat trapping gases from burning fossil fuels. And this is a direct quote from their foreign ministry official. This is only an illustration of the actions that we have taken and, and that they're going to continue going forward to make more of these changes into the future. And it says, but avoiding 300 million births means we've averted 1.3 billion tons of carbon dioxide in 2005. Well, that they're touting all of the carbon dioxide they've saved. Look at how great their one-child policy has been for global warming. Mm -hmm. Why should they have to do anything else? You can see how this could easily be adopted by anybody who takes that position that Greta Thunberg has. If you hold her position that we're on the verge of disaster, why wouldn't you do what China did? Because if we don't eliminate, if we don't have a one child policy, aren't we all going to end up dying anyway? The whole world is imperiled. That was China's logic, and they're using the exact same yeah. argument. Well, it, it, because it defending all defending their actions on climate change. Because it all comes down to the idea of it's for the greater good, it's for the collective, right? Because if, like uh, Justin, you mentioned this, uh, I'll paraphrase, but it's the idea if there's like some type of uh, uh, a factory that's like churning out some stuff, and the the toxic sludge from the factory is dripping into your backyard, like you have the right to, uh, you know, uh, protest against that and have that stopped. Right. So it's like the same thing. You know, if if people's carbon emissions, if you eating meat or you flying on an airplane is going to affect me because it's altering the climate, then we have a right as the collective to take action against that. Same thing with yeah. this birth stuff. These people that are in this documentary talking about how we're going to starve to death because these people are having too many kids, them as a collective have the right to enforce their will upon these people that are having too many kids. Right. And That's it's a, right. And, and it's a lie. I mean, one thing you learn about watching One Child Policy on Amazon Prime, so our listeners will remember where to get that. <laughs> we're, we're not sponsored by them, people. Not sponsored by <laughs> I wish. It'd be great. But, you know, you, you are reminded that totalitarian societies are all based on lies. And the ultimate expression of state power, actually, is to get an entire country to buy into that lie, or even if they don't buy into it, to actually, for, you know, just forget caring about what the truth actually is. And the climate change alarmism is, is parallel to this because that is a lie. Human activity is not going to make this planet uninhabitable. It is not going to result in sea level rise that, that takes out entire nations. It is not going to result in, a, in Miami being gone forever underwater. These things are lies. This is not true. Well, yeah. And so, but, but there is a segment of our society and these are progressives, and, and Justin alluded to it earlier with the prohibition, but also with eugenics, all came up through the progressive um, revolution of the early 20th century, and they have not changed their, their, their goals, and they have not changed their tactics. Their tactics are lies, uh, their goals are, are controlling human uh, beings and taking away our freedom to live life as we see fit, because, and they, they say it's for the collective. Like I said earlier, it's not actually for the collective, it's what the people in power say is for the collective. And right. if you can get enough people to, to believe you, who are suckers, who are, who are not free thinkers, who will believe that, um, yeah, I actually should give up my liberty for the greater good. Um, if you can get enough people to do that, then you start going down the road of tyranny. And this, this documentary, One Child Policy, sees the best example of this in, in modern times in the second half of the 20th century from this One Child Policy in China. We, we heard about it. You know, the whole world knew about this One China Policy, but nothing has ever examined it the way this great documentary does. And it is is frightening and yeah. everybody should see it yeah no doubt uh, a couple of things i wanted to respond to that idea is one is the the lie aspect but before i get to that is the idea of this actually being about control right so i was talking to a family member who was also watching this and they're saying like why would china even do this like the, they don't seem to care about people like why would they even try to do this even if it's under the guise of trying to make sure that nobody starves to death right and I was saying it's because they have a centrally controlled economy and they it's their job as the government, the way that they have their government structured to take care of these people. So if these people are starving and dying, then it shows that they're failing and it would probably actually result in civil unrest. So it's like it's basically they're not doing this because they care. 
uh, they're doing this to maintain control. So yes, I completely, completely agree with what you have to say. And to express their power, if you can, inv- if you can implement a massive, a mass force sterilization program in which you can, you can s- kidnap women, tie them up on boards, and drag them into into rooms to be for- forcibly sterilized. Yeah. If you can do that, you can do anything. Well, there's no doubt about that. Yes. Um, the Who, who's going to oppose you if you can do this without any any ramifications, without any any without a revolution coming or without any punishment? If you can do this as as the state actor, you can do anything. Right. Yeah. No. It's 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 alarming. Uh, the 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 lie aspect is another really interesting thing because I looked up reviews of this uh, documentary after I had watched it. And I immediately went to the one star reviews just to see what people had to say to criticize it. Some people had some pretty legitimate concerns. Like the idea that I alluded to that it's a, it doesn't show the whole context of the thing. They would really like it to be less limited in scope or whatever. Right. But there was a lot of people that were saying like, uh, yeah, you're criticizing this policy, but I don't hear you coming up with an alternative one. Like if we are really all going to starve to death, then shouldn't we do something? What, what are you proposing type of thing? Right. And so that's kind of the lie aspect, the idea that this is inevitable and we have to do something. They just didn't do it quite right. Right. So this kind of ties into the conversation that we had last week with the idea that we're going to run out of resources. We talked about how that's not the case. And even as our population increases, our usage of resources has either plateaued or even declined in a lot of these cases. And uh, one economist that did a really good job of kind of showing that this is that the that uh, growing population isn't necessarily going to bring on greater hardship is an economist named Julian Simon. He wrote a book titled The Ultimate Resource, which is basically talking about how people are the ultimate resource. And if you run the numbers, you would see that population increases actually uh, coincide with uh, using resources more efficiently. And basically the idea is that when you, when given the freedom to trade and innovate and just, you know, live in a voluntary way, that humans will lead to a, uh, a greater efficiency of the resource usage. And it's a fantastic way to look at things. Um, and uh, I, I think that like when this inevitably comes up again, Because when you have Bernie Sanders talking about how we have to do something about population increase because it's unsustainable and you got Camilla Harris talking about how we need to change the way that we eat, uh, this is inevitably going to come back. So the the work from Julian Simon is a great start on that matter. And the only other one thing, and I'll I'll come back to you, Justin, the only other quote that I want to read is from Joe Biden who in front of a Chinese audience, I think it was at some type of university, he said, your policy has been one which I fully understand. I'm not second guessing of one child per family. So, okay, Biden's been in politics forever. So he actually said this way back, way, way back in 2011. So just think think about that for a minute. 2011, not not that far away. (laughs) He's saying that it was incredible. And if you read it in context, actually, it's really interesting because it was a question and answer section. And the question, because it's classic Joe Biden, the question had nothing to do with one child policy. The question (laughs) was about economics, actually. (laughs) And how do you pay back? How do you how are you going to pay us back? for all this money that the United States owes us. Cause remember this is in 2011, like right after the financial crisis. Right. And this is a Chinese person asking about how the government is going to be good. The U S government is going to be good for the money. And he's talking, he's rambling on about spending and all of this stuff. And somehow he gets into the one child policy by talking about how America needs to uh, work on reforming its entitlement programs because of the baby boomers, because baby boomers are going to be causing problems. And then uh, because there's going to be all these people on Medicare and Social Security and all of this stuff. And then he he segues from that into you guys have some population problems here, too. And the one child policy. Yeah, I get it. You know, you guys have some problems. So maybe we can learn from each other. That's what he that's what he says and learn from each other and maybe come up with a solution to our problems. And you're just thinking this is the most bizarre Thing that you it totally unsolicited he had no reason to talk about it at all it wasn't like he was being cornered and yet somehow joe biden finds a way in a com a question about uh you know economics right. he finds a way 
to push himself into a corner where he's talking about China's one praising China's one policy, uh, child policy. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, as long as he didn't start talking about like that time that he was at the swimming pool and he had to like oh, fight God. some bullies or something, then it's probably a win in his uh, <laughs> on the Joe Biden curve. Good point. The other thing, the only other thing that I kind of want to bring up is a study that I've talked about numerous times on this podcast, which is called Population Engineering and the Fight Against Climate Change. So this was authored by some Georgetown uh, academics and a John, someone from John Hopkins. And uh, basically the main point of this study was talking about the policies that we could put in effect to change uh, or to affect population growth. And they put it on a scale of coercion. Uh, from on the left, the less coercive, all the way to the right, the most coercive type of policies. So on the far left is choice enhancement. So that's basically accessibility to health care, which is basically abortion uh, uh, availability. Uh, the second one, a little bit more on the coerce, uh, coercive side, is preference adjustment. So this is the propaganda stuff that we were talking about. Uh, now, the way that they talk about it seems to be a little less blunt as the way that the Chinese did it, how we were describing before. But, you know, they talk about using media, uh, you know, whether it's movies or radio or, or just pop culture or anything like that to get people to believe uh, that uh, they'd be happier with less children. The the uh, third level is incentivization, which is basically using tax policy to um uh, incentivize people to have less kids or to punish them when they're having too many. And then the last category, which they make it very clear in this uh, report, this study is just flat out coercion. And they talk about one child policy. Um, and that's the, I mean, like when you're reading through some of these documents, the world population plan of action, stuff that was developed in the seventies, uh, we never even talked about that, uh, national security memorandum that we were t talking about before we recorded Justin, but like all the language that's used in that usually fits within the first two categories, choice enhancement, preference adjustment, a little bit into the incentivization. But as I said, even when a country goes full bore into flat out coercion, you've got the UN giving them awards for it. So, yeah, Justin, any uh, any last bits that you want to contribute to this topic before we uh, lay it to bed? No, I, I think I think that the, the core idea here, the thing that we need to keep in mind always is that this is the end result of what happens when you put the collective in front of the individual. And it may not always be to this extreme extent, but this yeah. is the logical end of it. But at, at, to some degree, you're going to take away rights that belong to individual people if you're putting the collective first. And that's what the left is always, always doing. They are never putting the individual first. It's always about the collective. Yeah. I think when you watch this, and what's really striking uh, is, is, as Justin had alluded to earlier, Watch it just for the propaganda films. Yeah. Um, and it's it's actually proof that propaganda works. I mean, seeing yes. the difference between the attitudes of her own mother, her own mother who favored her brother over her to the point where he should go to more schooling and she shouldn't, mm -hmm. that um, the her brother, because um, they lived in a rural area so they could have two children. In fact, I think it's just a two-child policy now. It's not as many kids as you want in China. So they liberated it in <laughs> liberated in 2015 to allow people to have okay now even people in urban areas can have two children not yeah. just rural areas where they figure you need a couple of kids to work on the farm or whatnot but even her own brother said that you know my grandmother always saves snacks for me but not for her um you know and so if you co if you combine the preference for boys in a, in a culture like china with with a totalitarian um you know control over where you know you can only have one kid you end up with with millions and millions of girls either abandoned in baskets at markets or just aborted and thrown into the garbage. I mean, and again, it just points out to the her own parents thought all that was fine. I mean, I'm sure somewhere inside them, they, they know it's not fine. Yeah. But they talked it, they justified it, they rationalized it. Her own mother said, we'd all be cannibals if we didn't have this policy. And so it worked on them. And it's, it's the next generations that are starting to wake up and not and not buy that propaganda. And you think, hey, we're all too smart to buy that kind of propaganda. Yet what do we see from the climate change alarmists? We see almost the, the identical kind of propaganda and a lot of people buy it. Yeah, and, and here, here, I think this should be the final word on this. Uh, there, there was one really kind of powerful segment of this documentary where despite all of the 
uh, all of the propaganda that's being leveled, this idea that we're doing this for the greater good, all of that, there was still a faction of people that were going through the streets at night, picking up these abandoned children, bringing them to places where they could be adopted out of the country. So like even despite all of the the power of the government and the the force of the collective and this combined will, you still had people breaking through that matrix and doing what they thought was morally correct. And I'm sure every single person that was saved by that, whether they know it or not, like obviously like they can they can hang their hat on that. They can thank those people that put their own lives at risk because there was a lot of those people that ended up in prison because of those actions. And uh, it, it's, it, it just kind of shows the power of kind of like the individual, like just that, that human spirit, even in the face of something as just horrible and draconian as this. So uh, having said that, I, I think it would not be appropriate to go into my goofy legislation of the week <laughs> segment. So maybe we should just kind of wrap it up here. Uh, gentlemen, any any last words for the audience before uh, we sign off for the week? Isaac, find any good Yoda memes while we were talking? Oh, my gosh. So many. <laughs> So many. That's put those in the show notes. Donnie. Yeah, send me you one. Will. Send me oh, one. Yeah. I'll put one this in the be, show notes. This would be great. <laughs> send me one. Uh, Jim, any last uh, any last words of wisdom? Justin, anything? I got nothing. All right. I'll say just I'll, I'll say just watch uh, watch One Child Policy on uh, on Amazon Prime. Yeah, it's One yeah. Child Nation actually. Oh, it's so One yeah. Child Nation. My sorry. Yeah, of course. Yes, One Child Nation. <laughs> and Isaac just sent me a, a Baby Yoda meme. Fantastic. All right, folks. Thank you for tuning in this week for the In the Tank podcast. If you like our show, please subscribe, rate, or review for us on iTunes. We'd greatly appreciate it. You could also find us on SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, uh, YouTube, pretty much everything nowadays. If you'd like, you can follow us on Twitter at In the Tank Pod. If you have any questions, suggestions, comments, anecdotes, jokes, feel free to email us at In the Tank Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, Jim, where can the fine people find you? At Jay Lakely on Twitter or at Heartland Inst. And Isaac, same question. Where can the fine people find you? Baby Yoda Reddit. <laughs> yeah, what's your handle? <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So my my Twitter handle is the fracking guy, but you can find me on Baby Yoda Reddit. <laughs> Fantastic. And Justin, where can the fine people find you? At Justin T. Askins on Facebook and Twitter. Look for the big, beautiful blue check mark. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get like a little baby Yoda check mark <laughs> next to my name, and it's going to be way better than your blue check mark. <sighs> It's not officially sanctioned, though, so it'll it doesn't matter. Fake. It'll still be better. And thank you all for listening. And we will talk to you next week. <laughs> <laughs>